Welcome to Speaking to Civil Society and a very special edition on rural doctors and their work. We have with us Dr. Sanjeet Peter, who has devised an oxygen mask which reduces by as much as 50% the oxygen consumed by a COVID patient in hospital conditions. Dr. Peter is an accomplished heart surgeon, a cardiovascular surgeon, and director of the DDMM Heart Institute at Nadiad in Gujarat. Nadiad is a small city. Like many of our rural doctors, Dr. Peter knows to innovate. He knows to make the best use of his resources, his local resources. This mask comes out of that creativity. Thank you for having me here, Mr. Anand. And it's of course a pleasure to uh, share what we've been thinking of. But let's get straight to the point. When we started off with COVID care, we realized that whatever we do, we will be requiring a lot of oxygen to uh, give to these patients. Not only do there, is their requirement higher, the duration of their requirement is also higher. And therefore, uh, several hospitals are going to need this oxygen and we would soon be running out of it. And we had difficulty in procuring oxygen. So we looked at the methods of oxygen delivery and the commonest method of oxygen delivery is the non-rebreathable mask. And this is most popular, most hospitals use it. This is also called the NRBM. So let's understand how this works. Oxygen goes in from here and it goes into this plastic reservoir bag. There is a single opening for the oxygen to go in. It fills up here. And through that same opening, the patient actually inhales the oxygen. Once the patient inhales and then the air is exhaled, the exhaled air comes out of these side ports. And these are exhalation ports. Now, the problem with this mask, we realized, we were also using this initially, and then we realized that there are several problems with this mask. Number one is it has the same opening for the oxygen to go in and to go out. Number two, the mask itself, if you see when it is fitted onto the patient, there's lots of gaps on the side. So the oxygen tends to escape from there. Number three is when the patient exhales, because these exhalation valves are not very good and uh, not very efficient, to begin with itself, the oxygen escapes. Plus, when the patient exhales, all of it escapes from here. You must remember that exhaled air also contains oxygen and there must be some way in which we can trap that and reuse that as well. So that was one of the points that we thought of. Again, the fourth point is that when the air is exhaled from these valves, you must remember it's not just air, the patient is actually exhaling viruses. So it becomes very uh, unsafe for the hospital workers who are around the patient who are actually helping the patient to breathe. Finally, this material is quite flimsy material. So it's very easy for it to twist and turn and get blocked. It's very easy for this to happen, especially when the patient is lying prone. And as by now, I think everyone knows that proning is a, a very good method of increasing the oxygen saturation. But for those who don't, proning is a method by which the patient actually lies down on the stomach so that uh, the portion of the lung, which is at the back, actually receives more air and therefore oxygenation is better. So looking at all of this, we decided to address each of these concerns. And then we came up with, let me start off by giving you the reservoir. Now this is the reservoir. What we used was a urine bag as a reservoir. Now this is normally connected to the Foley's catheter, mm -hmm. but in this case, this is going to be connected to the outlet of oxygen. So the outlet port of the oxygen, mm -hmm. the oxygen comes in here and it goes in into this bag, the urine bag, mm -hmm. and then opposite end. So this takes care of that point, which I talked about, which is mm -hmm. different openings. So one opening for the oxygen to go in, and an other opening for the oxygen to come out. Okay. We connected this T piece. Mm -hmm. If this looks familiar to you, it's because it's from a plumber's shop. 
Uh, this is okay. CPVC tubes, which are locally available everywhere. Mm. It's the three-fourth inch tubes, which we you take a T junction and you connect it in this way. Mm -hmm. What we did was actually we cut it to size, we washed it with soap and water, dried it, and then uh, sterilized it using a gas sterilization, what is commonly called ETO. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we are using it in this particular setting. So we have a T piece connection, the lower end of this goes to the reservoir. The upper end actually goes to a mask. Now this is the mask that we use, which is again, a commonly used mask. This is a CPAP mask and fits in there. Now, just to give you a little bit about the CPAP mask, as you can see, it has silicone sides, padding on the sides. Mm -hmm. so, this fits so well that there is no leakage of air or oxygen whatsoever. Mm -hmm. However, this mask has only one port and that port is used for both inhalation and exhalation. Mm -hmm. So therefore, when we put this, we have now one inhalation from here and the patient exhales through this limb. So we added one limb for limb to that. Mm -hmm. exhaling. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So this is just a ventricular... Uh, um, this is a ventilator circuit, which is again very freely available, mm -hmm. about a six inch length of this. And at the end of it, we added a filter. This is again a commonly available HME, which is humidification and moisture, uh, heat moisture exchange filter mm -hmm. and uh, antiviral as well as antibacterial. So when the patient breathes out and the exhaled air actually comes out through this, it is hopefully virus free and therefore the environment is safer. Okay, so, so if, if for a minute I can just uh, try and sum up what you've been saying. You first change the bag, right, which is the usual bag which, is, which comes with the original device because you found that too flimsy and it would flip flop this way or that and you know, even become, become a knot. And you replaced it with an ordinary urine bag, okay. Um, then you used a mask which would seal the outlets in the sense that the, the exhaled air would not find its way back into the ward. Okay. Right. And where in the original mask there is the same inlet and outlet point, here you have created one through which exhaled air can pass with a filter and, and another point from which the person can inhale. Is this correct? Right, that's right. So that's what the purpose of this T junction is. Now, another thing is suppose this, this mask is not available, actually you can use even an ordinary anesthesia mask. So even an anesthesia mask is a well-fitted mask. The only thing is you might have to use a harness, which is something like this. So which goes from the back and then it, it goes on to these hooks in the front. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what this essentially does is that all and, and, the and uh, just a minute, the other mask you called it a CPAP mask. Could you just explain that a bit? Now, this is a CPAP mask. The harness is this black portion over here. The CPAP mask again uh, looks like this it has one port of entry and exit. exit. <coughs> It has silicone padding on the side. Mm -hmm. So that makes it actually again, uh, leak proof. Mm -hmm. So not only is the exhaled air doesn't escape from here, but even the oxygen that you're giving from inside here, that also doesn't escape that all of that as oxygen is then available to the patient too. To the patient. So even if the patient doesn't take it in the first breath, he doesn't lose it. Correct. Exactly. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. So this, this design is to make all the oxygen that you give available to the patient. Okay. Mm -hmm. oh, uh, now, uh, now what, has been the, what have been the benefits from this, this innovation? Oh, there are, what, what has it done to oxygen usage? The, there are two, two main benefits. And the one which was the intended purpose was the amount of oxygen. It has cut down our oxygen flow to less than 50%. So if patients who required about 20, 25 liters of oxygen in the regular NRBM mask, they require just about eight liters or six liters on this mask. 
So that means you can cut down the amount of oxygen to 50%. So that has been the biggest benefit. The second benefit, which uh, through our analysis, I mean, obviously we are, we are, we are doing an ongoing study on this uh, to see whether how much of benefit it is. And our interim analysis actually shows us that uh, close to 70% of the patients, we can avoid using ventilator. So those candidates who are for NIV ventilation, which will be the next step after an NRBM mask doesn't work. If you put this mask, 70% of them will probably not need further into a ventilation mode. So that again, I mean, so many ventilators get free. You can use it then for the sicker patients. Okay, so it, it might be interesting for you to just uh, explain this a little bit. You have the non-breathable, uh, uh, non-rebreathable mask, right? The NRBM. Uh, why is it called that non-rebreathable mask? Why, why, you know, it, this <laughs> NRBM sounds like a missile. Yeah, well, the non-rebreathable. So yeah. in short, uh, the exhaled air is not rebreathed. The patient doesn't rebreathe all of the exhaled air. So most of the exhaled air actually escapes. Yeah. And so he breathes in fresh air. Mm. So yeah. that's how it is non-rebreathable. But however, okay. in our design, mm. the patient does rebreathe a little bit of that. Whatever is trapped in that uh, uh, exhalatory limb, mm. they do rebreathe that. And therefore... Yeah. Okay. So we'll, we'll just come back to that. So, so one, you've got this NRPM. Uh, then, uh, then you have the... Um, the other the other ways of helping the patient, right? Which are non-invasive uh, ventilation. ventilation. That means you know you haven't cut open and placed it in, but the person is still on ventilation. Uh, so that's the second stage. And then, of course, the worst is when you when you have to put an invasive device to help the patient breathe. That's right? It. Is that's this it. it? So by by improving the performance on of the. Uh, non-rebreathable mask, you've actually reduced the load on the other two uh, forms of ventilation. Absolutely. What we have done is we've introduced a fourth method of oxygen delivery. So first, as you rightly pointed out, we had the NRBM, we had the non-invasive ventilation and we had the invasive ventilation. Now between the NRBM and the non-invasive, we've introduced this mask. So would, it, would you say that if this is widely used, it, it uh, makes the NRBM redundant then? I wouldn't say redundant uh, because our studies show that you need to ensure at least a five liter of flow in this mask. Uh, that will ensure that the patient actually doesn't rebreathe mm -hmm. and develop carbon dioxide narcosis. Mm -hmm. So if the patient's requirement is only four liters, then it doesn't make sense for us to use this. To well, use your innovation. You just, yes. So you just, just go ahead and use the uh, okay. non So So your innovation is necessary because the patients are actually not, not using four, four liters or five liters, but you have seen in this current pandemic that the patient's demand for oxygen has actually been several times what it, what it was expected to be. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So, so a patient who, who, who was expected to get five liters of oxygen per minute was drawing 15 and 20 and 25. And therefore the need for the innovation. Is that right? That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So this, therefore this is, this is what you had to do to be able to deal with that situation. Uh, what has it meant in terms of recoveries? Uh, as I said, this time around, Patients are taking longer to recover. They're, they're also taking uh, the requirement of the duration of oxygen therapy has also been longer. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm not sure whether it would reduce that amount, mm -hmm. the duration of recovery, because uh, I think the recovery really is a lot to do with the patient's own immune system. Mm -hmm. uh, but providing oxygen for a longer duration of time with limited resources of oxygen, this has been much more helpful. This is, that's the purpose itself. That's right. Okay. Um, you know, 
tell us a little bit uh, about how you put this whole contraption together. Now you're a surgeon and well known to be a skilled heart surgeon. Uh, and uh, here you are taking bits of pieces of piping and uh, you know doing these kind of innovations. One, how did the idea come to you? And secondly, uh, how long did it take you to put this together? So uh, let me tell you that cardiac surgeons, by and large, we are just plumbers. So <laughs> we do a lot of plumbing jobs. Yeah. Bypass surgery is nothing but plumbing. Okay, it's, uh, it's sophisticated plumbing, but it's plumbing nonetheless. So thinking about tubes and thinking about circuits and uh, being innovative in that is an everyday job for us. Uh, we do that in our surgeries. We do that in our perfusion. So uh, that's how we thought of doing something different. Mm -hmm. But the main reason why we uh, did this was because as soon as we started off taking in patients, we realized that our oxygen supplies were just uh, running out. Mm -hmm. And uh, the problem was definitely going to be that get, get more oxygen, otherwise you're going to lose your patients. So what do we do? I mean, we're not going to get more oxygen in a hurry that is. So how do we ensure that whatever little we have, we use it efficiently and we use it wisely. So that was the reason why we looked at so that. That's why well. you, you took another look at this mask and exactly. said, you know, how can we do Looking it, at it efficiently to see how, how efficient can we get? Mm -hmm. Your second question was, how long did it take for us to make it? Mm -hmm. I think one look at it and uh, it probably took us about 10 minutes. Okay. The first prototype. Mm -hmm. And then we realized that the length of the, the exhalation tubing, that really matters. And the, uh, the duration at which the HMA filters can be kept, like normally HMA filters, uh, which we use in ventilatory circuits, we keep about 24 hours and then we change it. But I think in this situation, we, we want to change it every 12 hours. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also realized that uh, anything more than eight inches of that tube could cause CO2 narcosis. I mean, we haven't had a patient of CO2 narcosis, but this is all in theory. So, so by, by, by CO2 narcosis, what you mean is that carbon dioxide levels would go up within, within the environment of the mask. That's right. That's right. So that's how the patient would develop. So this was a concern. I mean, uh, that's the whole point of the rebreathable, non-rebreathable mask. Because there you don't get a buildup of carbon. It gets let out from the sides. Correct. So over here, it would mean that they might be actually rebreathing that. So, so that would you say, say that, that is that is one risk factor with your innovation? Would you say yes, that's one risk? Factor? I would say that, and therefore I would recommend that this is not for home use. This is for use in a hospital setting. The patient has to be monitored, and it is used in that setting where the requirement of oxygen flow is higher in a non-breathable mask. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, now, uh, did you also have to bring down your optimum saturation levels a little bit, uh, you know, to save oxygen kind of thing? And, you know, is there something, uh, does the mask and the optimum saturation levels, do they work in tandem? Was that also yeah, part of your solution? Do. Uh, initially, that's what we did because uh, the recommended saturation, target saturation would be above 94. But uh, if we are to accept a target saturation of 92, that seemed to be also all right, because with the blood gases, which we did with the target of saturation 92, that's adequate uh, oxygen PaO2 that is available in the blood flow. So that, that was fine. But even reducing that target saturation to 92 didn't seem to help much because they'd still require large volumes of oxygen. So why do you think, uh, why do you think patients in, in this second phase of the pandemic require uh, so much more oxygen than they did in the previous phase of the pandemic? What's your guess? Uh, I am not really a, a pathologist, <laughs> neither am I a pulmonologist to take this uh, a question and answer it very well. But however, I can share with you my understanding. I think my understanding is that this virus just wants to survive. So if it wants to survive, uh, 
it has to make its patient survive its host survive because if the host dies the virus dies so that's the reason why i think it's allowing its host or making sure it hosts lives longer and therefore probably is putting it at that point where the host its host might recover but then it takes a little longer to recover and uh, i would put the blame on the virus this this is probably expected viruses sure. do mutate viruses do change in order to survive in any environment and i think that's what's happening so you think the virus is weakening itself to hang on inside the body or uh, what is it yes that's right it it wants to hang on inside the body because that's the only way it will live so it it, it doesn't so, want the patient to die it doesn't want the patient to die because the patient dies the virus dies virus dies absolutely so it like to prolong the illness so as to that, I, increase I, this is the simplistic understanding of what is happening <laughs> okay um in in the in now the other way you are uh, what are the challenges with regard to oxygen is it been very difficult to get oxygen uh see there's only one supplier of oxygen over here all the others are outside our district so we naturally we had we are our regular supplier was outside the district and uh, so we've had to do this uh, networking from other places and somehow get the oxygen i think there was a huge challenge initially but now things have been a, become a little better but yes i mean uh, uh, for example when we started off on a friday and on sat sunday morning my uh, oxygen technicians told me that see we're just running out of oxygen so fast that by the time we send our cylinder somewhere else and get it filled and come back uh, it's just to it's just not going to happen because we don't have that much time to send our cylinder so we needed to get more cylinders from someone else some other supplier and this supplier said no you are from a different district i'm sorry we can't supply that so then we had to negotiate with them and said no we pay you money up front and you give us cylinders so we had to uh do that buy cylinders from there and that's how we built up our stock of cylinders so that then we continued the two different suppliers that's how we kept it. so your your hospital doesn't have a captive plant of its own just it? no we don't because uh our requirement was never that much as i said our hospital is a small hospital 50 bedded exclusively cardiac so whatever we so, had was adequate for that so so let's say given your normal consumption of oxygen and uh, what it is under covid because the, the covid patients are coming to you uh, is it now twice or thrice or what is it your demand five times five, five times five times yeah. <laughs> so that's why we also weren't able to cope uh, a hospital like yours uh, state of the art heart care and located where it is uh, in your catchment how many what is the size of the population that would be turning to you i don't know who do you serve so we have a population of around uh, 3 lakhs both nadia and the area around us and uh, that would be our main area but then a cardiac center in this area would obviously not survive on just uh, a small area like this so uh, by and large i think about 20 to 25% of our patients are from this region but uh, 75% of our patients from uh, from outside even from the neighboring states uh, they come mm-hmm. to us mm-hmm. so, so how, how, how many surgeries do you do in a year or how many patients do you have in a year uh, how we can do we 350 open heart surgeries a year 350 that's right and what would be your success rate our uh, uh, mortality is less than 2% which is uh, which is as good as any center in the world <laughs> so it's been wonderful speaking to you good luck with your innovation and hopefully you'll get people to replicate it and you know be able to pass this on so that it gets more widely used in hospitals uh 
and uh, more patients benefit that that's all there is more places benefit great talking to you thank you so much thank you